Well, thank you all for coming tonight. Can you all hear me okay? All right. Um, so I really appreciate Montana Audubon inviting me to, um, in the last chance, um, to speak tonight. And uh, so what I'm going to do is talk about the Matador Grass Bank. But before I do that, I'm going to give you a little bit of context about uh, the work and just the Northern Great Plains and kind of what's going on in grasslands globally a little bit. So I, I put this slide up because we're not that far away from having yellow fritillary starting to pop out of the ground. So I took this one last year and I thought, well, it's time, time to get ready. Spring's coming. So when we um, think about grasslands, they're not like number one on the charismatic list in, you know, like we don't, those of us that work in grasslands usually aren't in National Geographic kind of specials and all that sort of stuff. And um, if we look at grasslands around the world, there's generally basically two different kinds. There's either temperate grasslands or tropical grasslands. So a lot of the grasslands that we know and are really famous are the tropical grasslands in, in Africa. Um, and uh, temperate grasslands are sort of the breadbasket of the world kind of grasslands, if you think about them that way. Uh, those are the places where most of the grain is grown in the world. And because of that, they've undergone a huge amount of change. And if you look at, this is from uh, IUCN, which is an international uh, conservation organization. And they looked at temperate grasslands across the globe. And they identified uh, four different temperate grasslands that are intact enough that they still function at their sort of full scale and full level or have the capacity to with some level of restoration. Two of them are in Asia. One is Patagonia and Argentina. And then the last one is right here in eastern Montana, uh, the western part of the Dakotas, and in Wyoming and part of Nebraska. So the northern Great Plains. Um, if you look at the rest of the Great Plains, um, if you go farther south or farther east, most of those uh, grasslands have been converted. So um, it's kind of neat in Montana, uh, we're not only in this kind of the best in North America, but Montana's the best of the best. Because we all know that about living in Montana, right? And there's nobody else here from anywhere else, right? <laughs> so when we think about grasslands, the thing that's a little bit hard to visualize is that when you're out there in the grasses, ankle high to knee high in, in central and eastern Montana, you're looking at about 20% of the grass. The rest of it's all underground. Um, and what's hard to think about is that a lot of the diversity of life is underground. So there's an amazing amount of uh, microscopic organisms you know, going around, which it's you can't get. You know, like WWF doesn't have a microscopic organism. They've got a panda, right? So. Um, it's hard to get people excited sometimes about those microscopic things, but um, it, it's a really cool and interesting thing. One of the, one of the really important um, elements of grasslands is that they are some of the best carbon sinks in the world because they put all their carbon, 80% of that growth, so something comes along and grazes that top part off or burns it off, the grass doesn't go away. You know, we often say, oh, our grass turned brown and our yard had died. Um, it's not dying every year. Um, it's actually going to come back, and that's how it works here too, right? So there's just this amazing amount of, of growth underground. And the other thing to think about for grasslands, especially in Montana north of the Missouri River, is that 12,000 years ago, uh, we were all under ice uh, north of the Missouri River, right? So. And these grasslands have basically been forming and evolving and changing um, as climate warmed and climate kind of varied. But when you look at this uh, scene, you're looking at old growth. This is old growth grassland that's been there for at least a millennia. Um, there's been you know, some changes in, in climate here over the last thousand years, but it's not been so warm and so wet to have palm trees or uh, so wet to have you know conifers growing out there. It's been a grassland and um, When you look at this you will not see this view uh, Generally in the state of North Dakota where I grew up and, and did some work for the Nature Conservancy These level kind of flat Grasslands are wheat fields almost everywhere across the Great Plains So Montana is one of the few places 
where you can stand out there and you can just revel in how flat it actually is and feel good about it. Um, and just you know, take in that flatness because we're always going, look at those peaks. Instead, you can amaze all your friends and tell them, look at how flat it is. That's awesome. <laughs> so some of the things that really like flat, so you know, I kind of joke about that and, and people um, um, you know, generally don't, don't do you know, posters of flatness. But there's a whole bunch of species that are really adapted and like flat ground. So pronghorn is one. It's, and it's not that they won't use rough or broken terrain, but when speed is the way you escape from things, and this is the fastest land mammal in North America, um, I guess second fastest land mammal in the world, um, that evolved to escape the Pleistocene cheetah. Um, and so they'll cruise speeds up to 60 miles an hour. Um, and one of the really cool things in Montana is that we have the second longest land mammal migration in North America. That happens here in Montana, and it's pronghorn. They come down from uh, the south central part of Saskatchewan, and they uh, will walk as far as at least Ingomar um, based on collared data. Um, so a graduate student a few years ago collared pronghorn in, in Saskatchewan and in Montana, and his farthest south moving doe was in seven miles from Ingomar when her collar fell off, and she was still going south. So how far south they'll go? We don't actually know, but what we do know is they'll go 250 miles. That's sort of the distance one way. Now the interesting thing is that they have different strategies. So some will just go short distance migrations, others will do long distance migrations, and it's a, it's a pretty neat adaptive, you know, responding to, to weather uh, of, you know, where you're going to go out there. So, do people like birds here at all? <laughs> um, so, one of the other really cool things about grasslands in Montana is that we have this really diverse um, grassland bird assemblage. And, um, the, the one tough thing about grassland birds, I just wish there was a few like red ones or, you know, I don't know, something that lights up or something. Um, but, you know, they're kind of cryptic for a reason, right? Because all of these species are not, none of them are nesting in trees, right? If you're an endemic grassland bird, you got to have grass to live in. So they're all ground nesting birds. Um, and uh, does anybody know what this one is? Any guesses? It should be obvious. It's like a day old. <laughs> so it's a long-billed curlew. That's right. So um, one of the really cool things about long-billed curlews, uh, a few years ago we participated in a, in a research project looking at migration of long-billed curlews. They winter uh, down in Mexico. They seem to really like soccer fields when you can see based on where their, their uh, GPS locations are at. I could look on Google Earth and see where they, they would be at over, over time. Um, and they, what they do is they, about right now or pretty soon, they'll start flying up into the panhandle of Texas and hanging out around Playa wetlands, which are these big, broad, shallow wetlands. And they'll hang out there for about a month. And when they decide to come to Montana, uh, they would basically get up and go. And within a day to a day and a half, they would fly from the panhandle of Texas to the Maddow Ranch, um, which just blew me away at the speeds they were covering and the, just the repeated patterns. Every year they just came right up the front range. And the data that we have it was about every four hours you would get a, a point location. So you kind of connect the dots and you don't know if they flew right over like Denver International Airport or ex you know, exactly where they're at, but just making these, these big amazing moves. And when we look at our endemic grassland birds, um, there's, there's a few of them up here. I was just going to see if I could play a song for one, if it would actually, if you guys could hear it. So have, who here is, uh, you can admit it, um, that you've gone out and gone bird watching out in eastern Montana or in the central part of the state? All right, we got a few people. So um, um, if you are just a part-time birder, a lot of people will call everything a little brown job. So it makes it easier. The list is pretty short. Um, 
But um, can you hear that? So does anybody other than Steve know what that song is from? Sprague's Pippet, yeah, yeah. So um, there, there's a really good story that, or a really good, uh, yeah, article that just came out that's in Montana Outdoors called Plowed Under, and they talk about Sprague's Pippets in there. Um, so um, that's a ground view of a Sprague's Pippet with its nest. You can see it's just, it's basically a grass bowl on its side. Those nests are incredibly hard to find. So. One of the interesting things about all of the grassland songbirds, they all do the same thing for these species that are up here. Um, they all fly up in the air while they sing. So um, the McCown's long spur is one of my favorites because it kind of flies up there and it looks like it's been shot and it kind of falls back down and it's just, you know, just really dramatic and just do that over and over and over again the pipit will be up in the air, uh, 30, 50 feet in the air, and will sing for hours and hours on end. The reason why all these birds do that is it can be a little bit windy out there sometimes, just every once in a while. Um, and um, in, in order to be able to have you know, a female hear you, you have to have a song that can cut through the wind. So, uh, uh, oh, about... 15 years ago, a, a PhD student in North Dakota dissected all these songs and played them uh, through various different kind of wind speeds and things like that, and was able to determine that that was they could get still an amazing amount of distance with their song. Um, and because they don't have perches, they sort of make themselves the perch by you know going up and singing. And um, it's funny because. Uh, this McCown's long spur and this bird sparrow, the pictures of them are on shrubs, and they just really hate shrubs. So it's kind of funny that, you know, it's just kind of like opportunistic on, on getting a photo. Um, so, and, and then just to go through, we got, you know, long billed curlew, frugis hawk, mountain plover, sprague's pipit, McCown's long spur, burrowing owl, chestnut colored long spur, and bird sparrow. So those are a bunch of species that we think about a lot when we're thinking about conservation delivery and, and what lands that, that we're interested in conserving. And um, one of the reasons why we think about those birds, I'll get into in just a little bit, but when you fly from Helena to Minneapolis, this pattern increases steadily until there's, there's none of the green stuff in between, right? It's just crop fields. That was the Great Plains that you're flying over. It still is. Um, but sort of the tough news is that uh, temp uh, global temperate grasslands are the least protected and most altered system on earth. So they're the most highly modified biome we have. Again, that's where we grow so much of our food. That's where civilization really kind of got started. So it's not shocking, but a lot of people um, are just kind of unaware of of how much has been modified, especially compared to things like tropical rainforests, which kind of get you know more of the press and things that grasslands are are you know have the highest uh, conversion rate. Um, the uh, current conversion rate of grasslands is higher than tropical rainforests. Doesn't make the covers of the magazines very much. Um, in North America, depending upon if you're in the tall grass, about 99% converted. Um, if you're in the southern short grass, pretty much about 50%. If you're in the, the northern uh, Great Plains, um, sort of that stronghold, it's about 30% crop and 70% intact natural habitat. So a lot of people think, oh, this all happened back, you know, turn of the century and, and doesn't really happen anymore. Um, just in the last, well, a little over five years. Um, you know, almost four and a half million acres were converted. The previous 25 years, 25 million acres were converted. So places like eastern Colorado saw huge sort of plow outs. 
uh, Kansas, places like that as well. So a lot of conversion has gone on. A lot of conversion continues. And um, these are just a couple of pictures from uh, Montana. You can see the scale when you go to break ground. It's pretty easy with these big tractors to plow under thousands of acres. Um, and this is a picture I took over uh, west of, of Glasgow. They were in such a hurry to plow that field that they windrowed all the rocks and a bunch of the topsoil into a pile about four feet high um, in order to clear that field off. And basically all this rock you see here that's all from Canada. So that all came down during the last glaciation. So a lot of these soils are not very good farmland, right? We've put the best stuff into production. So now we're kind of playing with those areas that are, are less productive. And one of the, um, one of the uh, results of that is that grassland birds in blue here are doing the worst of all the bird assemblages in North America, and if you look just for the U.S., Hawaiian and Oceanic birds have a higher degree of, of uh, threatened and endangered. But if you look behind that, you know, grasslands are, are right in there for, so, for mainland North America. And, um, you know, as it says here, they're really sort of the canaries in the coal mine. Those species I, I had up on that slide, they're all declining, okay? So 40% um, since 1968. Um, one of those species, Sprague's pipit, is under consideration as a threatened species. Um, Henslow sparrow, which is more of a tall grass species, and chestnut collared are considered you know, nearly at, at that near threatened level. Um, and sort of the most staggering of all is this McCown's longspur has declined since 1966, so the start of the breeding bird survey routes that people do every year. It's experienced a 92% decline. And it's not a species that you can easily confuse with another. It kind of looks a little bit like a chestnut colored longspur, but you wouldn't drive by and see a whole flock of them and think they were robins or, you know, I mean, obviously qualified people doing this stuff. So they're, um, they're not doing well. So I've, I've highlighted these four. Um, and a lot of our work that we're thinking about in conservation and working with ranchers are around these four species. And you can see the rates of decline here. Um, you know, there's not a lot of other species that would decline by 75% and people just kind of go, eh. You know, it, it would be a big, big deal, right? Um, so uh, a few years ago, we were trying to sort out, and there's kind of a big conversation, I'll say, among scientists about, well, what's driving all this change out there? Um, is it because there's just a bunch of bad management going on on grasslands? Um, or is it this you know, destruction of habitat? But the declines are more than the destruction of habitat. And um, so uh, the Bureau of Land Management and the uh, uh, Plains and Prairie Puddle, LCC, and the Nature Conservancy all got together and supported a PhD um, student. And she completed her dissertation uh, this year. In, so I just took one little piece from that. Um, and so this is for a Sprague's pivot and the likelihood that you're gonna find Sprague's pivot. And it's the old sort of real estate thing, you know, location, location, location. So if you look at this, the green up here represents intact natural vegetation. And if it's really intact, you have a really high chance of finding that bird there, okay? If it's not very intact, but it's next to really intact stuff, you still have a pretty good chance of it being there. If you compare that to a landscape that's been really fragmented up, lots of farming, lots of um, cropping, probably tree rows, those sorts of things, even when it's mostly grass, it's not as good as not very much grass when it's not in a good location. So this is like you know buying a really nice house next to the interstate. You buy that house, probably gonna get a bunch of house, but don't expect a bunch of money back for it. And then if you go to really bad habitat, it's not surprisingly really bad habitat. So when we've thought about this, we've said, well, even if you manage the heck out of this and just made it the best breaks pivot habitat in the world, what really matters is having a lot of grass. So if you're gonna go out there and, and manage land, 
um, the very first thing that you want to think about for these grassland birds, and this pattern holds true for Baird sparrows and the other two long spurs as well, is that more than anything you need is grass. So keep the grass out there is about 90% of the job. And when we think about these birds, another really interesting thing is that you won't get all four of these species on one acre. It just doesn't happen. They don't have big ranges. You know, they're kind of like a half acre to maybe an acre and a half for a breeding range. But like the McCown's long spur likes it to look like dirt. So when you drive by on the highway and you see a really beat up, horrible, awful looking pasture, McCown's long spurs are really happy about that. <laughs> Doesn't look nice visually. Um, and as you go up with more and more grass till you get to the Baird Sparrow, um, you know, you've um, um, got uh, uh, the tallest vegetation needs. This sort of mid and tall is what everybody manages for, like BLM on public allotments, Forest Service, state, everybody's managing for this mid and tall. And if you looked at it, these birds weren't doing great, but these guys were doing a lot worse. So it's interesting, we don't have enough people grazing hard enough, which is not the way we've all been trained, right? We all want to see a bunch of tall, wavy grass out there. Um, but if you're a McCown's long spur, you don't like it. And if you're a chestnut card long spur, you're now extirpated in the state of Minnesota, except for one little tiny spot, because all the t remaining prairie in Minnesota is all managed as tall, waving, um, six foot high, tall grass prairie. So this is my pun. Let's dig into conservation. Uh, um, so where does the Nature Conservancy work? We won't talk about this, this boring, ugly stuff on the west side of the state, right? Um, so we're here in Helena. We actually do work in the crown of the continent in southwest Montana. And I'm the guy that drives five hours one way or longer to get out here. And this is our northern Great Plains work. We're, we're talking about growing our work south of the Missouri River here um, because I guess I evidently sleep too much. Um, and um, so we'll, we'll be doing that. Um, oh, let me just go back here. So this number eight is where our Matador Ranch property is at. It's just so just to give you an idea, Haver's about an hour and a half, Lewistown's an hour and a half, and then Malta's about 40 miles to the north. So we're basically right in the middle of the state, you know, three hours north of Billings, um, uh, north of the Missouri River. And um, one of the things that we did, we bought the Matador Ranch in, in 2000, and actually it was sort of a multi-year acquisition, but by 2002 we had 60,000 acres, 31,000 that we own as fee ownership, 29,000 we leased from BLM in the state of Montana, and we thought we had really accomplished something, 60,000 acres. And then you start looking at the landscape and you start thinking, well, what if everybody plowed everything up around us? That would be really bad. Um, and we started thinking about all those species and things. And, um, and all of a sudden, 60,000 acres is kind of a postage stamp. So the landscape that we're working on is about 3 million acres. So we did about 5%. We're not, you know, kind of knocking it out of the park there. Um, and um, so we said, well, we need to not focus inward on managing our property. We need to be thinking, focusing outward and working with the community <laughs> And gee, why, why were we interested in this as a ranch? And why are we interested in this landscape? And why are all these best places? I didn't go through the whole laundry list of most sage grouse, you know, all that sort of stuff. The best habitat for almost all these grassland birds and, uh, are in this area and, and in this area north of Glasgow. And all basically related to the fact that it was all in grass. And we didn't have Marissa's research at that time sort of pointing us to the obvious. But we kind of have this gut inclination. The grass is good, so let's try to keep that. And so um, there was a, a project down in New Mexico called the Melpi Borderlands Project, which was this really kind of revolutionary you know, thing where actually ranchers were viewed as conservationists. It was crazy. Um, so um, um, we talked with those folks and said, well, we could do that here too. And we talked to the folks in the local community. And, and so started this concept called a grass bank, or, or copied this concept called a grass bank. And basically, all you're doing in a grass bank is the Nature Conservancy owns a bunch of grass, and we're going to discount the cost of that grass to lease to a bunch of different ranchers out there who are going to 
want to come and graze on us because it helps make their operation more sustainable. You can have more livestock, um, or you can rest your ranch or you know, do other good things. And in, in exchange for you doing conservation on your work, the cost to graze on us goes down. So you can save yourself some money. Um, and um, if you've ever negotiated with ranchers and farmers on anything, as I tell people that work for me, if you start out at zero, they're going to want a better price. So, um, so they all know that, too. Um, so what we do is we, we um, uh, talk to ranchers. Some people are farmers who have cattle. Other people are ranchers who may have some cropland. And so what we do is we evaluate every ranch that's interested in being on the Matador to see if do you have conservation value uh, versus are you just a, a farmer with some cows. Um, and um, so we sort all these ranches out um, and then we manage all the grazing element side of it, um, take care of fences and water and do all that sort of stuff. And then the ranchers are, you know, the cowboys. They're out there moving the cattle and doing all those sorts of things. And um, we, we do this with three different herds. So we have a cow herd, a cow herd, and a yearling herd. Um, you can see a whole bunch of like lines if you're further back. Those are all the movements that will happen between pastures in a year. So um, the yearlings will show up the 1st of April, so uh, you know not too far from now. And they'll be on us until uh, the middle of December. The cows will show up around the 1st of June, and they'll be there for about five months. So part of what you buy into when you come to the Matador is you're going to be moving cattle. We're not moving cattle, although we will help and you know kind of get strays and things like that. But um, and um, what it does is it creates an opportunity for people to work together on a whole bunch of stuff. The other thing that we did, which everybody said you can't do this, and I talk to people today, they still tell me this isn't possible, you're not really doing it, is that each of these colors represents anywhere from like five different ranches, five different ranches, to like uh, 12 different ranch operations. So all these people are commingling their cattle together. Okay, so. What that means is that you bought a bull for like $3,000. Your neighbor, of course, never has as good of bulls as you. Um, but you guys are all putting your livestock in together. And you're all just taking a chance on whose bulls are you know, going to be with whose cows. I don't think I have to go any deeper on that. Um, <laughs> but um, um, so um, it, it's a, sort of a real leap of faith. What it does is it really strengthens the community of people because they're all now talking about um, what cattle, what bulls, and we also sort of um, segregated out so we allow livestock that are, what's called, we call it Angus influence. So you can't put a white cow out there. It's got to be a black or a red. Um, so there are some standards on, on that side of it. And the other thing that we, we do is um, in our lease, which is a pretty lengthy document, we have very specific criteria that the ranchers put in about health requirements for all those livestock out there. So we're the enforcer, but we're just enforcing what they are telling us what to do with those cattle. So enough on the cow side. Um, basically, the way it works out is we charge $26 for a cow-calf pair for a month, which is about market rate. You can go higher, you can go lower, um, and then for every one of these discounts, you get dollars off. So most of the discounts are based on your deeded property. So I said before the matter is about 50-50 private and 50% um, state federal. That's a really common thing in this part of the world and it, it varies. Some ranches have almost no federal or, or state leases. But um, so we're giving all these discounts or offering these discounts on, on their private ranch lands and then we have some like prairie dogs on public lands as well because um, it has an operational cost for ranchers and we're trying to encourage people to retain as many prairie dogs out there as possible. We have a requirement, you have to run your livestock in common. You have to not ever sod bust. If you break ground and you're in the Matador grass bank, you can never come back. So we didn't want people dropping off their cows and making wheat you know, off of grass. Um, somewhere else. You have to have an approved ranch management plan. We don't want 
you know, people that are participating with us to have, you know, the worst looking ranch in the country. Um, and then these other ones are optional. Um, and we have a, um, I didn't get into the details, but we have a, a number of these optional ones that are a little bit more detailed than optional um, related to wildlife friendly fencing and, and uh, restoration of grassland and, and things like that. Um, and what you can do is you can start out at $26, but you can get down to 13. 13 is really cheap. If you can do that, you want to be able to do that. Okay, so. Yeah. The neighbors run their livestock in common, then when it comes time, they're going to send them to market or whatever, so they then cut them out. That's right. So they all sort them out. They all work cattle together. So when they go to uh, 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 pregnancy tests, um, uh, uh, cows and, and yearlings, they do that all together. All the owners get together and do all that work together. Yep. And who approves the ranch management plan? I do. <laughs> <laughs> so we actually give people an option. You can do a ranch management plan with uh, NRCS, the Natural Resources Conservation Service. You can do that with a private sort of certified you know, ranch consulting kind of company. Or you can do that with the Nature Conservancy. Almost everybody has chosen to do that with the Nature Conservancy. I must be a real easy mark or something, but um, I thought nobody would. That was the funny part. Yes? What's the ratio of animal to acreage? Um, in this part of the state, it's generally about five acres for a cow-calf pair for a month. Yeah, so this is, you know, 10 to, well, the matador is actually the wet part of, of eastern Montana. We get about 13 inches at our headquarters, um, 20 miles east of us. You're at uh, 11, some cases 10. So it's pretty dry. What kind of density are you talking about in terms of the total number of animals in this region? As far as on the ranch? Mm -hmm. um, well, you can think about those numbers. At times, there'll be a whole lot of cattle in one area, depending upon how big the pasture is. And other times, they'll be very dispersed. And we, we have cases where we want sometimes put a whole bunch of cattle together. And I'll show you an example of, of where we're doing that for management purposes. So um, this is what most of the folks that I work with look like um, outside of you know, working with agency folks and things like that. But um, this year we'll have 19 um, uh, ranch operations. Um, uh, so. Somehow I typed in the wrong number or something for the intro. We're at about 260,000, a little over 260,000 acres on those ranches. So with the Matador, you know, we're over um, 320. Um, and of those 19, 13 of these are ranches where these are like, you know, pretty well established um, kind of multi-generation ranches. Um, and six of them are beginning ranchers. Some of those beginning ranchers own a little bit of land Others don't own anything. And um, to begin with, we didn't have any beginning ranchers at the Matador. And it was one of those things that folks brought up and said, we're not going to be here forever. We got to get new people out here and all that other sort of stuff. There's a lot of people that want to come back. Um, there's a lot of you know, young guys that are struggling and trying to make a go of it. Um, and we said, OK, we'll take 10% of the grass that we have a year and make that available to these beginning ranchers. So try to help those guys get going. And, what we've done is we've set the program up so that you have six years to go from being a beginning rancher sort of without property to having some property. Um, and I'll get into this a little bit uh, more later, but we didn't want to have somebody start out with us at 25 and at 65, they would still be a beginning rancher. So we, we're, we don't want to see people doing it for recreational purposes. We want to see, um, we're committed to this idea that ranchers are grass stewards we want to work with. So just kind of go through some of these discounts. This is on a ranch about uh, 25 miles um, uh, east of the Matador. And uh, so in 2015, um, our, our no sod busting discount was on a little over 61,000 acres. Now, we have, there's more private acres than that, but not all of, of eastern Montana is farmable. So there's places where you can't really crop it. We use NRCS information to, to help decide what, what's tillable and what's not. Um, for grazing plans, we're at about 120,000 acres uh, of grazing plans. 
Um, when I sit down with folks, they're basically opening up the books, which is kind of like asking me asking you, how much money did you make last year? Um, you know, it, it's kind of a big conversation to have with people. And um, basically, our, our management requirement is that you have to be within carrying capacity of your ranch um, for, for your livestock. Um, you have to be moving your cattle around some, you know, in some fashion, especially on your native pasture, so they're not in the same spot grazing the same way every single year. Um, and um, all of your infrastructure needs to be basically friendly for wildlife. So you have to start working on your fences. You have to put escape ramps in stock water tanks. So these um, water tanks that are out there, birds will go and land on the edge, get a drink, fall in, can't get out, drown. Um, grouse will do that. Um, so you put these little metal ramps in there and then they swim over there, get to the ramp, dry off, fly away. Um, and um, um, so uh, these plans are sort of uh, as an audit versus me saying, you're gonna move your cows here tomorrow kind of thing. Um, because we want, these folks have been successful. They're, the reason they're out there is because they, they have gained a lot of experience. We want to encourage that. Um, got a burrowing owl on a prairie dog town. So we stagger our, the price of our discounts based on the likelihood that a prairie dog town will have burrowing owls generally at about 15 acres or so. You're more likely to have burrowing owls on a prairie dog town. After you get up to about 71 acres or so, um, you're more likely to have mountain plovers on a prairie dog town. So we scale the discount on the prairie dog town based on the size of the prairie dog town and just you know really encouraging people to um, keep prairie dogs where they're not going to be you know in your hay field or in your backyard or you know that sort of stuff and um, um, it's really worked well I mean sometimes people this year was one of those conversations they seem to be doing really well and it's like yeah that's good huh um, but um, um, you know, on public land, they're still shooting and those sorts of things, but it, it seems like it's diminished some uh, here compared to where it was about 10 years ago. And then uh, for sage grouse, we're working on about 67,000 acres of private land that's sage grouse habitat. So, you know, uh, not all of this is uh, suitable for sage grouse. And what we've done is we've worked with um, uh, all of our folks where if you have a place, so sage grouse, will run into fences. When they, in the spring, when they go fly to the lex to do their uh, 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 dancing and, and displaying, like you can, you can see here, the males will inflate air sacs and they're on these displaying grounds and the females come in, pick the best dancer, so to speak, and um, I don't have to explain anymore. Um, and um, uh, so some research was done a few years ago and they said, where are the places that sage grouse are most likely to run into a fence? And it's when they go at early light, at like two, three in the morning, they'll fly into these leks. And sage grouse don't fly like 100 feet up in the air. They're, you know, a few feet off the ground. Um, and if it's really flat, they fly really low. And so um, they would be hitting these fences. And a guy figured out that you could create more or less a predictive way of figuring out where grouse are most likely gonna run into fences. Um, and so what we've done is we've gone around and we have, if somebody has a fence, so probably the center of the leg is here, um, you put these little reflective markers on the fence and the grouse can see the fence because it's not you know, this little thin black line in the middle of the night. Um, and it will eliminate about 95% or, or more of those collisions that go on out there. Um, and so all of our ranches, uh, in order to get that discount, have to have those sage grouse markers in these high collision areas. They have to sort of account for the whole life cycle through their management plan. Grouse like everywhere from, you know, as short as you can get it to nice tall kind of stuff under, under uh, sagebrush and everything else. And then you also have to do those um, um, escape ramps. So, you know, we've, we've done all that on average every year. We're discounting somewhere about $65,000, $70,000 off of the income that we could be bringing in. Um, so we're putting real money out there. Um, and, um, you know, I kind of look at those discounts as a way to bring people in. It starts to build a conversation. 
you start to build trust, you build familiarity, um, you build understanding, and that understanding goes both ways. So one of the other really key elements of our grass bank is that we've really tried to push um, and develop a, a science curriculum, so to speak, out there through research. And every year for the last, this will be our year number six, coming up on June 15th, we have a Matador Science and Land Management Symposium. Last year we had about 110 people show up. Um, they're uh, agency folks and ranchers and um, um, other people who are sort of curious. Um, we have people from Colorado, Alberta, Saskatchewan, um, South Dakota, so we're, we're kind of getting people from around. Um, and this is just an opportunity for people to take a breath in, in the summer, which is hard for field biologists especially to do, go out there and just have a conversation about what's some of the new science that's going on out there and what's some of the new research, and really trying to bring people together. Um, and um, One of the other things that we're doing is saying, okay, well, historically, fire had a big role in this landscape. So we know about every 8 to 12 years, based on tree ring data, that there were fires in this part of the world, maybe even a little bit more frequently than that, both set by Native Americans as well as from lightning strikes. And so we've started a, a fire program out there, um, not exactly a raging inferno, until you stand next to it, and then it is really hot. Um, this fire is backing, um, so the flames are a little bit lower, and you can see here it's like really short and green uh, versus where it's not. So if you're a bird that likes short vegetation, you show up, that's like primo sort of stuff there, right? Um, the other thing that we're doing, which I, when I went to college a million years ago, as my daughter would say, while the dinosaurs walked the earth, um, <laughs> we throw cattle in on these areas as it's up and growing and it's called patch burn grazing. Historically, that's the way it would have worked with bison and elk and antelope and everything else that were out there. They go out there really attracted to that young green vegetation. They mow it down that much more. We have a master's student at University of Montana that's studying this now, so um, we can understand it a little bit better, um, both from the wildlife perspective as well as from the livestock production perspective and from the vegetation perspective. And um, one thing is that it's not only sort of green and delicious um, for cows, but it's super high in protein. So we had a, a student um, do uh, some work out here on small mammals and uh, just as an undergrad, and he found that all the small mammal traps were filled over here, and he could hardly find a small mammal on this side over here. So green is really good in grasslands. Everything likes green. Here's a question. Yes, sorry. Right. Yep. So we start burning. Uh, we'll start in about a week and a half, and we'll be done by 10th of April, 7th of April, something like that. So it's a pretty narrow window. Um, a few birds will be there. Uh, you'll see like raptors kind of know what's up right away because all of a sudden there's not any cover if you're a small mammal. Um, <laughs> so there's a bunch of things looking for food when you do that, but we're missing that whole window of you know most likely, you know, destroying a nest or anything like that. And that's probably, we're probably really sort of mimicking mostly a Native American burn cycle. So Native Americans would have been doing the same thing, create all that green grass, makes it a lot easier to hunt, you know, wildlife if you know where they're going to be. Um, the, um, another fun project that we have going with the Alberta Conservation Association and the University of Montana is that these fences out on the landscape have consequences. Um, so, you know, things will perch on them, um, and they also can block wildlife movement. So, if you've never seen this pronghorn, uh, basically, I don't know if they can't, because I have seen them jump fences. They prefer not to, like, they never want to. Um, so, outside of very rare circumstances, they'll go, they go under these fences. Um, and the fence needs to be a certain height, and, and that's kind of been well known for a period of time. The problem is that you've got thousands of miles of fence, hundreds of thousands of miles across eastern Montana, right, where we have pronghorn. So you can't go and just fix every one. I mean, we would be 
rolling up fence forever. And so what we're doing is we're testing different things. You can't probably see this very well, but these are little metal carabiner clips. You know, don't cost you very much money. And so um, we've got a bunch of different things going on, but where we've uh, put those clips, um, the pronghorn then will select for those locations and, and go through in those areas. Um, the other thing that we're doing is also looking at smooth wire. So you have those barbs on the barbed wire. And if that fence is set low and they really want to get through, what happens is they will, over time, wear off their coat. Um, so that picture is taken in Alberta where I guess they still have winter. We don't evidently in Montana. But when it's 20 below and you're running around with your coat unzipped, it's pretty, pretty darn cold. So this has a consequence. Um, one of the really great things is that as we you know, talked with ranchers and kind of showed them this research and we're wrapping it up this year in July, is that um, calves don't go underneath that. So people like that. Um, and they really care about these animals. They don't like to see them piled up along the fences and all that other sort of stuff. And if you can make it quick and easy, people are going to be interested in doing that because it's just the right thing to do. They steward, think about stewarding those animals just like they do their own. Um, so that's been you know, just an ongoing study that, that um, is um, kind of fun. And then um, I, we had this conversation or question here about you know, putting um, numbers of cattle, like how many is that? So this is a, a, a fence here. This was all farmed at one time, and including part of this. And this is this really sort of nasty invasive grass called crested wheatgrass. It's planted, you can go and buy it. It's all over in the Helena Valley. If you go, you can buy the seed. Um, so it's a really common use, you know, planted pasture grass. The problem is in this part of the world, you plant it, the wind I know surprisingly blows, and then the seeds get moved. And these plant, this species produces an amazing amount. So in a, in a square, so in a three foot by three foot area, Crested wheatgrass will produce more seed than all the native plants in a similar size plot um, put together. So it's producing way more. So one of the things that, um, that's also interesting about it is that it's used as a pasture grass, but cows don't eat it after about the 1st of July um, because it's really coarse. It's not very nutritious, um, so they don't like it. And, um, so what you get are these places where it'll just be acres and acres and acres of just this ungrazable sort of cardboard out there. And when you put a lot, a lot of cows into a small area, you can force them to eat it. And then they'll change it. It'll all of a sudden be more like a lawn, and they'll like it, and they'll graze it. The other thing that's really good about that is that this is most active and best growing and most, most nutritious at the time when the native grasses are the most susceptible to grazing pressure. So we're now incentivizing people to increase their density and development of, uh, because everybody's got this on their ranch for the most part. And so we're trying to get people to use that more intensively um, so that their native range is healthier because the cows are, are not on there when the grass is most actively growing. So, and then just not to get too much into this, one of the last things that we're doing is that, you know, these grass bank things are, are discounts are, you know, kind of an annual thing. So you could say at some point, I think I'd like to farm, and, you know, you can certainly do that. So to really kind of ensure that that grass stays in grass, we're using a tool called a conservation easement, which you may have heard about or read about in the paper. Basically, a conservation easement is a perpetual um, uh, right that's given to the Nature Conservancy or Fish, Wildlife, and Parks or Montana Land Reliance, Prickly Pear Land Trust, whatever the case may be. And um, we have this right to maintain that property in a natural or mostly natural kind of state. The landowner has the right to continue to graze livestock and do those things that they, they need to do to um, you know, have livestock, like have fences and things like that. And, in the last um, five years, um, we've done about 31,000 acres of conservation easements, um, which isn't you know, like a monumental number. I'm hopeful that here in about a month, I'll be able to say we're, we've done 46,000 acres of conservation easements, because we have a big one coming up. 
Um, but um, when I first started working with people out here, it's for a real independent-minded Eastern Montana rancher that you're going to you know, give up your right to be able to do what you want to do on that ranch. That's a pretty big step. So we're building momentum on this. And what I would say is that we could do a lot more. There's a lot more interest than there is funding available to do it. Um, so that's kind of a, a challenge that we have. But, you know, it, it's really gratifying to work with people who are committed that they're going to keep that grass permanently in grass um, forever. How are the ranchers compensated for that? Are there tax deductions? So there's a couple different ways. Great question. Um, you can take a tax deduction for the value of the easement, which is based on an appraisal. Um, generally, let's just say grass is worth $400 an acre, which is a pretty common number. It's generally going to be worth about $160 for a conservation easement out there. Um, you can, uh, we'll also go and just straight out buy uh, a conservation easement. And I, I, I didn't mention that. One of the things that we're doing with these beginning ranchers, because you can't really pay for land with cows at $400 an acre for grass. So with our beginning ranchers, we're working with them. So the picture that I had up there was a ranch where the son bought the ranch from the parents. So, because the parents have to have some kind of retirement because they, you know, everybody's the same out there. They're land rich, cash poor. So your only retirement is when you sell the ranch. Um, in this case, the son was able to buy the ranch from the parents and use that easement payment to pay down almost all the debt. And so for our other beginning ranchers, I have regular continuing conversations with them about properties that they're looking at to see if those would be ones we'd be interested in acquiring easements on, um, or F Fish and Wildlife Service or Fish, Wildlife and Park. So it's, it's a kind of a one-time tool to support that transition, but that's the challenge that we have today, you know, 40 years from now. I don't know what the answer will be. I'll be retired. Um, <laughs> but um, um, anyways, so I, I guess what I just, kind of a few closing thoughts here, and thanks for bearing with me for taking your evening, but, you know, it is really a great place to get out there, um, you know, especially, you know, kind of May and June is when the birds are going crazy, so if you enjoy bird watching, um, uh, there's some amazing places out there, you know, like Bedoin National Wildlife Refuge, Medicine Lake, um, those are just great places to go see a lot of wetland-associated bird species. You'll see a bunch of them across this landscape as well. They're just more concentrated, you know. I don't know how many white pelicans there are between those two refuges, but a lot. Um, and just, you know, a lot, of, a lot of these other shorebirds. I think one of the really fun things about being out here is all these species of shorebirds that nest and basically spend almost their entire life cycle on grass. So, you know, curlews are, they're out there in the grass. They're not at water. Um, and even things like marbled godwits that do use water quite a bit more you see them out on the grass as much as you see them by water. Um, and they're, you know, big. These are big birds compared to the little brown jobs. Um, but <laughs> if, you, if you get out there, that chorus with those little brown jobs is just really sort of an entrancing thing. You know, there's just so many bird species that are singing all at once. Um, so I, I would encourage you, at the Matador, we, um, um, you know, it's basically open to the public. The only thing we say is if there's cattle, don't go there. Um, and that's just kind of a safety thing, or we don't want people opening gates and then going, I can't get the gate closed. Oh, it'll be okay. Um, um, then we just have a whole bunch of extra work. But, um, and there's a lot of BLM ground out in this part of the world too. This is just north of the Charles M. Russell. So it's really kind of, a, you can spend a weekend and not even scratch the surface. Um, or even spend a week and, and still have a lot to see. So, any other questions? I'll start in the back. Yeah.